Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, my name is Jeremy Robichaud. I'm the Assistant Director here at the Maynard Public Library. And tonight we're uh, again welcoming David Mark uh, speaking on the history of transportation in Maynard. David is of course a member of the town's sesquicentennial steering committee and has been hosting this series of local history talks throughout this year. And this is of course the, uh, the, the 10th talk in this series. Um, there will be, uh, this, is, this is almost it, that there's uh, one more after this. And uh, that talk will be on uh, the food cooperatives on uh, Tuesday, December 14th at seven o'clock. And David is going to be speaking about the, uh, the long and storied history of food co-ops that existed in Maynard um, from the oldest and to the most recent and uh, of course possible future with um, the, the Asabit um, uh, co-op. Um, you can sign up for that program uh, and also view previously recorded programs at uh, maynardpubliclibrary.org slash May 150. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to David. All right, Jeremy, thank you very much. And at this moment, what I'd like to do is say, this is the official history book of the Cecil Centennial Committee. If you haven't bought it for yourself, buy it now. It also makes a perfectly good holiday gift for anyone you know who might need to know. It's also a good housewarming gift. There are new people who've moved into your neighborhood. If you've sent people off to college, this might be a good gift to remind them of uh, about their home. And if they need to explain all about Maynard, and um, this is the way to do it. It is for sale now at the library and also continues to be a sale at uh, Six Bridges Gallery on Main Street. And you can also order it in various places online. So there's the plug, buy the book. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna, uh, I'm not sure. Yes, we're, we're muted, okay. All right, so. I'm gonna begin the talk. There's gonna be a period at the end for questions, either put in a chat or live, and then there's gonna be a set of bonus slides about the Aspect River Rail Trail. So I hope you'll stay through the Q&A uh, to those slides because uh, the rail trail is a very interesting part of our transportation story too. So let's get to um, share screen. Share. Um, slideshow. Come on. All right, Jeremy, can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. So again, here we are today, Tuesday, November 23rd, to hear about transportation from horses to airplanes. Um, there have been a couple of recent columns also written about this. If you want to read a bit more about it at uh, madeoflifeoutdoors.com. And definitely appreciation here to the Maynard Historical Commission and the Maynard Historical Society, who contributed so much to developing the history of Maynard. Um, just a reminder that this year is 150th anniversary of the creation of Maynard, April 19th, 1871. Uh, remember where the book is and it's a perfect holiday gift. So, and December 14th, as Jeremy said, is the last talk we have. December also brings an end of year concert at the sanctuary, which I think is scheduled for December 19th to include the closing of the time capsule um, for another 50 years. All right, we've got a little uh, montage here of, of transportation through the years. So um, definitely on foot, we know, and on horseback. Uh, trains came into town in 1850. Uh, the golden age of bicycles was started around 1890. The first car was sort of going clockwise around the very first car. This is not that first car, but the first car in town appeared in 1899. But this particular car is a Ford Model A. It was available only in red and uh, was purchased by Mr. Person in 1904. Um, it was also possible to take a steam launch from Maynard on a regular schedule up to Lake Boone, which was definitely a place where many people had summer cottages and places to stay. You'll see then um, the trolley coming through the center, the intersection of Mason and Maine. And the trolley was with us from about 1900, 1923. Um, shortly thereafter replaced by the Lowell bus line. And for those people who are not lifelong residents of Maynard, you may not realize that Maynard had bus service from um, 1923 all the way up to 1972, but alas, no longer. 
Now, if you're gonna be walking around, it might be helpful to have a little bit of light. So what we have here is an example of the kerosene street lamps that were set up uh, across Maine. This happens to be the corner of Maple Street and Brooks, uh, and that has a horse delivery cart in front of it. The trees you're seeing were planted in 1870, which is when most of the houses on Maple Street and Brook Street were built. But the house directly in the center with its mansard roof was built in 1875. Um, the streetlight program was begun in 1878 with 25 of these scattered around town. And that meant someone had to go out and light them every night. Um, by 1891, the town was up to 74 lamps. These were lit sunset to midnight. Um, anyone out past midnight was expected to have their own kerosene lamp. And a few businesses then were starting to supplement street lights with their own gas lights. So in 1902, um, the town of Maine signed a contract with the American Woolen Company to provide electricity for 92 electric street lights. And today's Maynard's several thousand street lights are light emitting diodes with the exception of some early 20th century style historic fixtures in downtown Maynard. So we are lit. This chart was developed by looking at each annual report because horses and cows were taxed. Because they were taxed, they were counted. And in doing so, we learned that the horse population peaked at just around 1900 at 256 horses. So the human population at the time was about 3,100, which meant you had basically one horse for every 12 people. And you have to realize most of those were horses for businesses um, during the various deliveries to and from the railroad, from businesses to houses. So definitely people were still getting around the old fashioned way, which is walking. Um, so by 1929, the population almost doubled by the number of horses that dropped to 50. The trolley was servicing a lot. The train was servicing a lot. Car ownership was still very rare at that point. And the woolen mill, as we'll see later, employed thousands of people, but had no parking lots. So Coughlin's livery and stable opened in 1897. Um, the family transitioned to an auto repair shop in 1913. And then in 1949, uh, Burton uh, turned it into the Fine Arts Theater. So the same building um, and many horse owners boarded their, didn't keep their horses at their houses or farms, but boarded their houses at Coughlin's or at uh, Parmenter's uh, or at Henderson's or other boarding stables. You have to realize that horses, unlike cars, just can't be parked in the driveway. They require 15 to 20 pounds of hay or pasture per day, plus five to 10 gallons of water and stalls had to be mucked out daily. So there was a lot of work uh, in managing a horse. And uh, most many people, again, didn't manage their own horse, but had it kept at a livery and paid um, uh, a stable fee. We have some examples of horses at work. So if you go clockwise from upper left, um, this is the hose truck for the fire station which is now where, uh, well, where, where the paper store was. Um, and that was the station until 1955 when it moved to its current location, soon to be abandoned. Uh, the middle shot then is Go Go Gove Bakery. Uh, then you've got the Riverside Co-op Delivery. Uh, you see C.J. Mahoney stepping out in his own little um, two-seater and his horse uh, happily has the, the top down because it's a sunny day. So there were some privately owned horses um, for private businesses. And then the bottom left actually shows that where now the Boston Bean is was the Maynard Post Office. And the one to the right is actually a post office delivery wagon um, out there delivering the mail. The railroad, the Fitchburg Railroad Company, 1840, 1900, later sort of merged into the Boston and Maine, but it reached Acton in 1844. And then a spur was developed coming south and west and reached Asimut Village in 1850. This was sort of the making of the mill because the mill had water power, but up until this point, they were having to use uh, horse-drawn wagons to bring the raw wheel in from the Acton, South Acton train station to Maynard and the finished goods back out. But once they had their own train station there and train tracks in Asimut Village, um, it became much easier bringing raw materials, including very shortly coal because the mill switched over from water power to coal-fired steam engines. So this is what's known as a 440 engine. Uh, what you're counting is the number of wheels at the front 
And then the power wheels is the middle number. And then many larger engines had wheels under the cab itself, uh, but this one did not. Uh, across the top of this, from left to right, you've got an oil lamp, the smokestack, a bell. That dome there actually contained sand and was allowed to be controlled to drop sand down onto the tracks right in front of the drive wheels to provide for greater traction. So in times of slippery or wet weather, um, they had a sand supply. And then the one behind that is sort of the steam dome and a whistle on it. Uh, so the power is provided by two double acting pistons. And I think if I show this just to the, the left of all the men, that's one of the pistons. By double acting, the steam was put into it to push it this way. And then the steam was pushed on this side to push it this way. So it was being powered by steam in both directions. And there's a matching one on the other side. And these were directly hooked up to the wheels by rods. And there's your powers all coming from those two pistons. The train station, uh, which sadly no longer exists, was um, built right along Main Street to the left. Uh, this is the front of it. Uh, here shows the back next to the tracks. And it was torn down in 1960 because passenger service had stopped in 1958. And then instead was built this um, small gas station here right on Main Street, uh, which then at one point was a dry cleaners and is now is, is I think mostly just sort of um, storage. So sadly, we don't have a train station, nor do we have a public building that could be uh, a place for basically a, call it a, a town museum, visitor center, public bathroom. Um, that option is, is, is long gone. Well, some railroad scenes. Um, there were a couple of accidents, some minor ones. The one on the left, <laughs> someone managed to rear end a caboose, you see, and this is over the Florida Road Bridge. Um, to the right, you'll see a view of the tracks. Uh, so to the left of that, you've got Main Street. These buildings still exist. There's Railroad Street. You've got uh, uh, Foley's uh, Linoleum Center and the Indian Restaurant. This apartment building is still there. There in dead center, if you can see it, is the train station. You notice you have multiple tracks and you've got no parking lot, uh, which was filled in later than created there next to the tracks. And of course, this is all paved over and became part of that parking lot. But again, all the building on the left still exists. At that time, you had electric wires on telephone poles. So I wanna say for a while, when these trains were coming in, passenger service again stopped in 1958. Uh, freight service lingered on to late 1960s or early 70s, we're not exactly sure. The elevated berm, if people, if some people will remember there was an elevated berm and a railroad trestle over the Aspen River behind the outdoor store and where CVS is now. That was removed circa 1980. Um, tracks elsewhere in town persist as late as 2015 before being removed for the rail trail. <clears throat> the golden age of bicycles was really quite short, but it was wonderful. After the invention of air-filled tires and before cars, there's a period where everyone Everyone, everyone in the bicycle. So you had two major styles. And, and the point here is a familiar name. John Dunlop was a veterinary surgeon, but he had the idea of putting an air pressured tire inside a rubber tire. He patented the concept in 1888. By 1892, he was a millionaire and Dunlop tires were everywhere. And the people of the US were buying bicycles like crazy. You had sort of two major styles. Um, you can see in this upper left, the Bicycle Club of 1896 has these very large wheel uh, and then had a very small wheel behind it. And, and the seat was really quite up high up here. And these were quite fast, but also quite dangerous because any sort of bump, you might do a header over the high wheel. It was hard getting on, hard getting off, maybe a little bit hard staying on, but they were very simple uh, mechanically. Um, a few years later, it was referred to as the ordinary bicycle or safety bicycle was built, which had the things we know, it had chain driven, had brakes, this is therefore the bike club circa 1900. And you see that is it, we have it here, a bicycle built for three, which is ridden by the priest brothers and everyone's wearing their matching jackets and hats. Um, Ray and Sons of course now is still selling bicycles and there's still some commuting going on. But again, the golden age of bicycles was really that very tight period, 1890, about 1905, 1910. And then we had trolleys. The Concord Maynard and Hudson Trolleys Company 
existed from August 1901 to January 23. It was a, there was a combination of a disastrous fire in 1918 in the car barn. The war caused coal shortages and competition to, from cars led to its demise in 1923. But the schedule was 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. And early years, there were over a million riders a year. Now, service, not just Concord and Hudson, but had a, a spur going up to service south and then finally west of Acton. One of the important points that made it so popular was that uh, prior to national prohibition in 1919, each individual town was voting itself wet or dry once every year. Maynard tended to stay wet. Acton, Sudbury, and Stowe, Hudson tended to go dry. So you could get on the trolley for a nickel, head to Maynard, buy your alcohol supplies and go home again for another nickel. And also you have to realize most of the shopping in the area was in Maynard. Um, Stowe, Sudbury, Acton, these were basically low population farm towns, uh, barely a thousand, two thousand people each compared to what they are now. And if there's any shopping at all, you took the trolley to Maynard to do that shopping. So we'll see a few more pictures of what we had. And you have to realize you could go anywhere by trolley. What we see here highlighted dark line in the center is the Concord Maynard Hudson line. But once you're at Hudson, at that roundabout, you could get a different trolley company to get to Clinton or to Worcester. If you're Clinton, you could change again and end up in Lemonster or Fitchburg. Going the other way, you get from Concord and into Boston by trolley. Or of course, you also had train service into Boston. Um, it was so possible. Now again, here's just the picture of the station. So on the left, you have the power station, which is now the Indian Orthodox Church. On the right, you have the car barn with this tall door, tall doors, and that's now an office complex. So the buildings are still with us, uh, repurposed. And just to show what it looked like, here's Main Street, um, sort of a, a packed a dirt road, the trolley tracks down the middle. You've got the Masons building here. Uh, you notice the horse tie-ups on the other side. And this round structure here at the intersection of Walnut and Main was the um, bandstand. And there were concerts uh, Wednesday and Friday nights from the bandstand. And it had its own electric lights. So this was just a very popular. People would come, stand there, listen to the concerts. Uh, there wasn't any problem with cars because there weren't any cars. The crowd had to move aside for the trolley to go by and then move back in again. Now I mentioned that they had, in addition to the regular cars, a couple of these very fancy cars that had wicker chairs, drapes, electric lights, and you could basically rent these for private occasions, sort of think of it as your own private bus or limousine service. And you could go not just on the regular route, but you could arrange to go, you know, all the way to the shore or down to Rhode Island. They just switch it from line to line to line. So these were basically uh, things that could be for hire um, uh, for events. We now get to cars. The first car owned and made it was a Stanley steamer um, that's steam powered. The Stanley Steamer Company was a Massachusetts car company and was purchased by Dr. Frank Rich in 1899. He was partial to steam as second and third car uh, were also, so the picture here is of his second steam car. He was very partial and the Harriman brothers who owned Harriman Laundry also initially went in for the steam powered vehicles, excuse me. Which were mechanically somewhat simple. Um, but very soon you started seeing um, internal combustion engines, gas powered cars. So Charles Persons versus the first Ford in town. That was the earlier picture we saw in 1904. By 1925, the town tallied almost 900 cars, motor vehicles that includes trucks, and was down to about 70 horses. Turns out Massachusetts was the first state to require license plates in um, June of 1903. Now, um, not this car, but the one we saw earlier with person. The Model A had, ready for it, eight horsepower, had a top speed, a level ground of 28 miles an hour. By 1910, just six years later, there were car dealers, there were repair shops, there were gas stations, there were rentals, you could rent car by the hour. There were attempts to control speeding through town, some people were dragging through town at 30, 35 miles an hour, kicking up dust and scaring the horses. And the first reported accident, um, it was 1910, a small boy was bruised, 
but not otherwise harmed. And by the way, newspaper ads in 1914 offered a Ford Model T cars for $500, you could have it in any color as long as it was black. Today, there are now two used car dealerships, two rental businesses, four gas stations, electric vehicle charging, we'll touch on that later, and a dozen or so repair shops and parts establishments in Maynard. Now, if you remember, I said the absence of parking. The picture on the left, unfortunately undated, shows the mill. We know it's sort of after 1920 because this center large building was built in 1819. and I had to drain the pond to build it. Um, these, this was 06, I think this was 1911. You see the pond here quite large, really right up to the railroad. On the other side, all those huge parking lots. So if you now look at the picture on the right, you see the parking lot facing Maine. You see these, these upper and lower parking lots, um, one right across from the uh, St. Bridges Church being turned into a fire station. Um, so the pond shrank to be filled in for parking. But at this point, Maine was a walk to work town. Uh, if you notice also carefully, you see there's two chimneys there and one of them, the one on the left was demolished and that was part of the landfill used to fill in there to make the farmer's market parking lot. Now, I do want to talk for a moment about roads because if we're gonna have transportation on roads, we have to know about roads. And some of the roads predated Maynard by more than a hundred years. So from Sudbury to Lancaster, going south to north, they crossed the Assabet, and it was now the White Pond Road Bridge that goes to the Wildlife Refuge. Old Marlboro Road, sort of cut across the bottom of Maynard that connected Concord to Marlboro. And then Concord Road was um, the route um, of the Minutemen from Stowe to Concord to shoot the British on April 19, 1775. So those are a few of our old roads. And while we're talking about old roads, Marie, Joseph, Paul, Yves, Roche, Gilbert, de Montier, the Marquis de Lafayette, and his entourage were visiting the United States to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Revolutionary War. And he was touring a 13 month tour, uh, visiting uh, many states at age 66. You see a portrait of him on the right um, at about that age. And he actually passed a long Concord Road through what later became Maynard as he was traveling from Concord to Stowe, where he was met for a light reception, some entertainment, a band, and then he carried on to Bolton for the night. So we had Lafayette passing through here um, in 1820, so it was September 2nd, 1824. Now, if we have roads, we have bridges. And I want you to realize there are currently 10 bridges in Maynard. And what we've got here is the names of those bridges, the first date, if there are any interim bridges, the current bridge, the age of the current bridge and its material. And as most of you know, Florida Road Bridge has just been closed because it is 106 years old and is so structurally deficient that it was just scary for you know trucks or cars to go across. Uh, bad sight lines, narrow lanes. Uh, one of the points you have to realize is that reinforced concrete bridges are expected to have a lifespan of about 60 to 80 years. We've got not just this one, 109, but we've got one, two, three other bridges that are 99 years old this year that are also reinforced concrete and a few others that are 80 ages. So we, we are part of what's overdue for bridge replacement. Um, now, one thing about the Florida Road Bridge is, I don't know if you realize that when that was built in 1915, the cost of that construction was $6,011. Um, the new span will be 10 feet wider. And it's also gonna cost a little bit more than $3 million. Um, so if you take what's going on in the entire country, because we know where infrastructure is, is, is coming apart, of the 600,000 plus bridges in the US, 40% of them are more than 50 years old. 9% are considered structurally deficient, meaning they must be inspected every year because every year they're suspect of, uh, of failure and require significant maintenance, rehabilitation, or replacement. So there's our bridge story. And I think Florida Road was actually a, 
officially finally closed today and is expected to be closed for um, close to two years. Mm. If we're talking about cars, I want to mention that we're now starting to have electric vehicle charging stations. And some of you may know there's some electrical vehicle charging at the parking lot across from the fine arts. At the moment, it's out of service. I'm not sure why. But if you visit Town Hall, behind Town Hall, there are now these one, two, three, four charging stations where you can bring your car. I think, I'm not sure if these are actually officially in, in working order yet, but they will be soon, if not already. And you can pay with a credit card and have your car charged at these stations behind Town Hall. And across the other side of the parking lot, the town has its own electric vehicle, uh, which it and only it is allowed to be charged on that side of the parking lot. But this and the other sites, and I, I'm not sure if there's a charging station being set up at the library, but it looks as if we're going to have the option of electric charging yeah. cars. Jeremy? Yeah, sorry. We, we do have two charging stations um, that are uh, unofficially in you. They, they can be used. All right. Now, are they free for the moment? Uh, they're free for the moment, but I believe they are um, going to be, they will be uh, pay at, at some point. It's just for the moment they are free though. Okay, now for people considering electric cars, uh, they should be whether right now there are federal and in some cases state tax credits for buying an electric vehicle and that these may actually increase if the Build Back Better bill becomes law. So that's I think recently passed by the House with the wind of the Senate. So there's a potential here for a very significant um, tax break for buying an electric vehicle. But you should also know that some states are concerned that they're losing revenue loss to reduced money raised by gas taxes. So they're coming up with an annual tax on electric vehicles in addition to the existing tax on, on cars. So there's some attempt to grab back some revenue uh, for cars that are running electric. Now I had mentioned that the trolley stopped and then the buses started same year the trolleys ended and he started by covering the trolley route to the South Acton train station, but later extended it much, much farther uh, to Clinton, to other towns. And in summers, you can get a guest bus from here all the way to Revere Beach for a dollar and a quarter. Now, John Lovell died in 1945. The family sold the business to the MBTA in 54 and bus service remained stopped in 1972 and is, is unlikely to ever return. Now, at the same era as the trolley, as I mentioned, it was possible to get up to Lake Boone, summer resort area, uh, by steamboat. It, it, one end of the line was behind the trolley station, and the other end was right by the Lake Boone Bridge. And you then get off, walk a short distance, walk out on this pier, and this this boat, steamboat, the Princess, would then take you to various spots and sort of did a loop around the lake, dropping people off at various docks because there were no roads around the lake at that time. But there were clubhouses, restaurants. Um, drinking establishments, um, I understand you're in Prohibition, there were some illegal drinking establishments there uh, and restaurants. So it was, it was really definitely the summer place to go. Uh, and there were many cottages there. Modern day boating, many of you may be aware, is that there's a kayak and canoe launch dock at Ice House Landing, uh, which is then put away for the winter and restored in the spring. And this provides access upriver from the dam. The dam is there in the back. And you've got miles of upriver, uh, as long as you can stay away from the swans, I think it's fairly safe. And there are few people who paddle through the center of town. There's one very intrepid uh, kayaker who's working the rapids uh, near the rail trail bridge, who basically just puts in there to paddle around and, and have fun with the, uh, the fast moving water. Yes, let's mention airplanes. I'm gonna say really, and blimps and balloons, really? So what we have on the left is a visitation by the monster.com blimp. And on the right, a hot air balloon that was passing over the rail trail about six o'clock one morning and then went on to land on the golf course. What's the history? So prior to World War II, uh, there was land between the Aspet River and Powder Mill Road. Um, it was a grassy field, kept mowed, and plane overs would land and take off there. Uh, and then early in 1941, with the threat of war with Germany on the horizon, um, Maynard appointed a chief air raid Warren. And after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, Maynard decided to build an airplane observation tower on Summer Hill, 
that became operative and staffed in January 1942. And many of you know that um, Sid, as in Sid Mason, had his own private airstrip behind his house off of Summer Street. It was an official FAA approved airstrip on their maps and lists. It existed from 1948 to 2016. Um, it was behind the house of Sidney Mason at 165 Summer. It was kept operative um, primarily for ultralights by his son after his father died and Jack sold the house in 2016. So we no longer have um, an airstrip here in Maynard. Now let's see what this looked like. Here's Sid and his wife and dog and his plane that he was using to take off behind his house. On the right, you see an older picture of a biplane having landed on the Powder Mo Road. Um, on the left of you, what Sid's strip looked like behind the house covered by snow. And in the distance, of course, there's a house, which meant as Sid's taking off, he's taking off, driving his plane to get to a speed of 80 miles an hour directly towards this house and then lifting off high enough to get over the house over the trees and continue on. So it was a little bit nervy to people in this house, especially if they're out back having a barbecue to have watch this plane come zipping down the grassy lawn, bumping towards them and finally swooping over their head. On the right, you'll see the tower that was built atop Summer Hill to watch out for airplanes. This actually had no useful function whatsoever because you have to realize Germany had no aircraft carriers. There was never going to be a German plane flying over the American coast. Now, along the coastline, there are submarine observation towers, which were useful because submarines usually traveled on the surface and could be seen and planes sent out to bomb them or destroyers sent down to. But the purpose of this tower um, was not. Was not. So at this point, why don't we switch over to questions and answers? So we'll... Um, Stop the share. Jeremy, why don't you start us up? If there's any questions in chat, people can put questions in chat for Jeremy to ask, or if those run out, we can ask directly. Okay, uh, so no questions in chat currently. We were all uh, watching the presentation, but this is a good time. Um, oh, we're, we've got a question already. Uh, so Trevor asked, uh, what happened to the Summerhill Tower? It was turned over to the Boy Scouts, and then at some point it burned. Hmm. Now, I'll add to that, if you looked at that, Summer Hill looked suspiciously treeless. Summer Hill was cow pasture, uh, really well past World War II era. And the forest you see up there, if you're walking on the town trails through there, you think, this is very nice, it's virgin forest. Those trees are all, basically almost all less than 100 years old. That forest has grown up since. World War II. Okay. Um, any other questions coming in? Actually, I, just a quick question that I had about Sid's airport. Were there any? Were there ever any like emergency landings um, other than you know just Sid's airplane? None that I've ever seen any record of. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, I think ultralights were flying in and out. Um, I, if if I were a pilot. I'd look for a lot of other places to land than on that, that skinny tree-bound strip behind Sid's house. Of course. Uh, this question comes from Carol. Uh, is the Summer Street airstrip still active by whom? Um, so, yeah, um, it, I, I, it's not active. Uh, no, no. Um, and the other thing too is if you if you want to ask uh, if you want to ask your question too directly of David if you raise your hand uh, that's one of the Zoom um, functions there on if you if you um, click on the little blue net button next to your name and click more and then raise hand you can, um, I'll put you on and ask your question directly to David. Uh, but here comes another question from Scott: uh, Which came first, the canal on Great Road or railroad? Crossing Great Road, or the railroad crossing Great Road? The canal came first because the canal was what connected the dam to the mill. So you have to realize part of Amory Mater as part of William Knight's, part of their genius was realizing that they had bought an existing mill on Mill Road, which had a small um, water backup. And they realized by moving the dam about half a mile upriver and, and creating their mill about half a mile further down, they got a much greater vertical drop. And they were also able to back up much more water 
by building the Ben Smith Dam and connecting the two by canal. So the canal um, went in around 1846 and the railroad didn't get here until 1850. Okay. Um, this question, Nancy and George, uh, the tower, somebody uh, just uh, mute themselves there. Um, what's the tower related to the water storage tank? We're getting some feedback, so I'm not sure how, I'm not hearing the question. I'm trying to figure out where that's coming from, but anyways, uh, so yeah, where was the tower in relation to the water storage tanks? All right, I don't know exactly. I know the, the first water storage tank was built there in 1888. Um, I don't know if, if, has, if anyone's ever been up there to visit the water towers, you, you can walk on the woods trail and see them, but there are now two. And I'm not sure where exactly the, um, the observation tower is built in relation to those, or I haven't been able to figure out where its, its remnants are either. So sorry, no answer. No problem. Um, this is from Judy. There was a granary on Nason Street. It looked like a spur of the railroad went to it. Do you know anything about it? There were many spurs off the railroad line and you saw the busy tracks we saw through the center of town. But for example, there was a long spur that went into the mill itself um, to reach the far south side where the, the, uh, the, the coal and the steam engines were. Uh, and there was also a, a parallel tracks all along uh, Upper Nason Street because uh, there were all sorts of businesses there, lumber businesses, coal yards. Um, there, were, there was a, a coal yard behind what is now the outdoor store. Um, there's another coal yard, the other side of the tracks behind what is now John's Cleaners. So you had sidings where these, these you know, freight cars could be left and unloaded and loaded. And definitely along Nason, there were multiple tracks. Uh, this question comes from Trevor. Uh, did the Lake Boone Ferry go directly into Lake Boone? Was the spillway not there at the time? It did not connect at all. Hmm. Uh, Lake Boone was enlarged by building a dam, that the existing dam that's there now, and you had to basically get off onto a deck, a dock um, where the bridge is and then walk. It's about 100, 150 yards to get to the Lake Boone, which is you know a higher elevation uh, than the river. So there was no direct boat, you had the transfer. Um, let's see, this is just a comment from Charles that he said his mom used the, uh, the bus, uh, presumably the, the level bus to get to Boston a lot. Uh, um, anybody else wanna ask a question or have any comments for, for David? If not, we'll go into a little bit about the Aspen River Rail Trail and then we'll have one more chance for, for questions. Yeah, let's right. go ahead and do that. Maybe somebody, some folks will have okay. to. So let's that. go back to share screen. Trying to see where we left off. Okay. Ah, okay, we're there? Yes. This shows the installation of the bridge servicing the Asabet Rail Trail over the Asabet, which was basically built in the end of the parking lot and then lifted into place by this crane and very, very, very carefully lowered down onto the, um, uh, the ledge on both sides. Um, and um, seems to be standing us in, in very good stead. Um, I don't know if people are aware, but uh, there's a tendency now for teenagers to sort of go under the bridge and, and sit there and perhaps just hang out, um, maybe smoke substances, drink substances. Um, there's a little sign under there that says, don't smoke marijuana, everyone smells it. So, <laughs> Maybe someone found out that that, that doesn't work out that well. Um, now, the Asimov Rail Trail, the north end, the end is 3.4 miles from the trail, trail end at the South Atkin train station to the main Estoe border. 
So a groundbreaking ceremony was held in Maynard in um, July of 2016. This was originally budgeted at 6.7 million, which is a tremendous amount of money, but you have to realize there are a couple of expensive bridges, one here, one in Acton, a long boardwalk had to be built around the paper store office complex. Uh, there's some additional costs because there's a lot of a uh, soil contamination sort of behind Duncan Beamers and that auto shop there. Now clearing the route include the removal of approximately 600 trees that are more than four inches diameter, some exceeding 12 inches. And the reason I know this number is I walked from end to end counting them on a little clicker so we know a lot of trees went. Landscaping budgeted included planting about 550 trees is smaller, definitely smaller trees. Uh, the largest about two to three inches in diameter, many of them um, evergreens, and about 10% of those have died and are not being replaced. So uh, a ribbon cutting ceremony was held in Acton in 2018. The trail gets extensive use. Um, starting in, in the fall of 2018, um, Trail of Flowers, which you can visit trailofflowers.com, was begun to beautify the trail with flowering bulbs, mostly daffodils, shrubs and trees. And the concept is sort of taken from the bridge of flowers out west, except that's only a quarter mile long and the Aspen Rail Trail it is about, uh, if you count both ends of it, almost nine miles long. So we have a lot of places to plant flowers. Upper left shows basically uh, a snow covered trail on the north side of town. On the right, we had volunteers in this case from uh, Acton Boxborough School helping clear it before it was paved. Uh, lower left is the um, traditional uh, groundbreaking ceremony. They dump a load of uh, sand for everyone to stick a shovel in. And then lower right, two years later in Acton, uh, the ribbon cutting. Everyone gets the scissors to cut the ribbon. And the trail, as I said, has become very popular. Um, two things people ask and have to realize is the north end of this will never go any further or connect to anything. It will not connect to the Bruce Friedman Trail, which is passing several miles further to the east and north and south. So the natural end of the trail was at the South Acton train station. The other problem going south is there's a gap in the middle for all of Stowe and a chunk of Hudson that may never get completed because after the trains ended, the land was sold to towns, given the towns, the towns sold it to private parties and you've got private parties in Stowe who have no desire to sell that back or allow for right away. So we never, may never see the north and south ends of this uh, trail connected. On the left, an example, upper left of how the trees had grown over the tracks and uh, upper right, a company actually paid Maynard uh, for the privilege of removing all the steel for scrap steel. So those are the plates that would hold down uh, the rails and the spikes. Uh, lower left is the old bridge being lifted away by crane. Um, that picture was taken by me standing in the middle of the river, um, watching the bridge go by. And they actually waved me back a little bit. They said, not so close. So this is me backed up to take a picture of the bridge leaving. And then the, the company provided this picture uh, because they had someone operating a drone to take a picture of the bridge installation. And I asked the guy, I said, so what's with the drone? He says, for insurance purposes, if something goes wrong, we wanna have a record of it. I thought, that's very nice, but they were willing to share this picture of the bridge going in. I mentioned tree removal. In the upper lift, you'll see what's called a CAT 521B, weighs about 60,000 pounds. This red device at the end of the arm can cut through trees up to 22 and a half inches thick in several seconds. Basically, it's got a circular blade about, I don't know, five feet in diameter, heavily powered. It grabs the tree, cuts the bottom, then reaches over, you see in the middle shot, carefully puts the tree down, the right shot, the tree's down, and it's gonna move on to the next tree. All these trees are then dragged up to one end and chipped in a monstrously large uh, wood chipper. So no lumber, no firewood, but the chips went somewhere. Um, trail of flowers, we planted now uh, close to 6,000 daffodils and other flowering plants. Some of you may know across from Christmas Motors is the Marble Farm site, which is becoming an official town park. We have thousands of daffodils there. And when they bloom, the daffodil uh, sculpture appears magically for the duration of the boom. Uh, in Marlborough, Girl Scouts planted this little patch of grape hyacinth. We've got some natural flowers just growing along the trail on Railroad Street. Uh, those are black-eyed Susans. 
You can see a close up of some more of the daffodils. And um, again, there's a continuation now of planting flowering shrubs and flowering trees that are pollinator friendly and bird friendly because daffodils um, are neither of those things. So we're trying to also use uh, native plants and plants that are useful for pollinators. And I'll just say, we're planting every spring, we're planting every fall, volunteers are welcome. I think that brings us to the end of the talk. So we'll stop to share. Um, any last questions about that or anything else? And other than that, uh, we can bid you adieu, but first, this last chance, any questions? Okay. Let me see one. Um, yeah, this question comes from Trevor. Uh, where does the other end of the train line end up? I lose it after Interstate 4, uh, 495 at Route 62 in Hudson. Does it lead into the Clinton Tunnel? You've got the other end of the trail starts on Route 62 in Hudson. It um, goes under, I guess it's the, I'm gonna call it the 280 extensional for 495 crosses under that, goes through the center of Hudson um, and ends up in, in Marlboro, in downtown Marlboro. So that's about uh, 5.4 miles at, at that end. Um, it crosses the asphalt on a high bridge, uh, goes up and down some hills in Marlboro. And, and finishes up, uh, as I said, and, and uh, the trailhead is in Marlboro. So hopefully it answered the question. Uh, so it's again from 62 in Hudson and, and continues all the way through, right through the center of Hudson and then into Marlboro. Mm -hmm. um, this question comes from Scott. Uh, did the train tracks cross the canal close to the uh, to Ice House Landing? Yes, there was a, a bridge over the canal uh, there's no evidence of it there anymore, but if you think of where the rail trail is coming, where it's parallel to High Street and it's crossing Mill Street, so if you're standing there, you think of a straight line, the bridge the, the, had its own bridge there over the canal, uh, which, which is, is, there's no evidence that it's there anymore, but there was our, its own direct bridge over the canal for as long as the railroad existed. And just think it's been straight line from the continuation parallel to High Street. Um, okay, did anybody else um, have any questions for David? Oh, we got one coming in here uh, from Steve. Um, my impression is that the Acibit Rail Trail is used more for exercise and recreation than for commuting to the South Acton Station. Do others agree? In this regard, it's not comparable to the Minuteman Trail between, uh, I'm sorry, in this regard, it's not comparable to the Minuteman Trail between Lexington and Alewife Station. I'll say, I'm not sure we have a true measure of the mix because with the pandemic, um, many people no longer commuting anywhere. Sure. And many people have a lot more recreational time on their hands because they're not commuting anywhere. So yes, I'll agree right now, uh, a huge amount of the use of the trail is recreational. Um, yeah. Dog walking, kid walking, bicycling, jogging, bike clubs come through. Um, until we see whether commuting to business and working, you know, five days a week, six days a week at a, at a business somewhere that requires people to get to the train station and then, you know, towards Boston on the train, we won't really know what the, what the balance will be in the future. But I agree. It's not the same as the Miniman Trail, which has become, is a, a substantial commuting route. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, going once, going twice, three times. Um, Jeremy, I'll say thank you everyone for being here for this. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed putting it together. And um, again, our, our next talk is about the, History of co-ops from 1875 to 2022. <laughs> and I'm hoping you'll enjoy that one also. But th this was just a tremendous number of pictures available from the Historical Society that helped enrich this talk. Yes, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, David. And of course, you'll all get the, uh, the link uh, to the recording in your email if you missed part of it or you wanna watch it later, um, that should go out tomorrow. And um, thanks again, everybody. We'll see you uh, December 14th. Happy Thanksgiving.
Goodbye. Bye.